I stand alone on the word of God, the B I B L E. The B I B L E. Yes, that's the book for me. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, nothing. So we're in part two of uh, this series titled The Bible for Grownups. And uh, the reason I wanted to do the series and the reason I'm so glad that you're here and that you're watching or that you tuned in is because while most people, Christians, non-Christians, people even from other religions, while most people know some of or parts of some Bible stories, most people do not know the story of the Bible. In fact, one of the reasons it has been so easy for you to dismiss the Bible, for some of you, the reason it was so easy for you to dismiss Christianity or to walk away from your childhood faith is because while people told you Bible stories as you were growing up, nobody ever sat down and explained to you the story of the Bible. And part of the reason they didn't tell you the story of the Bible as a child is because you wouldn't be interested. And the other reason people didn't tell you the story of the Bible is because in many instances, the people that handed you your first Bible did not know the story of the Bible themselves. But this is a really big deal. It's a really big deal in our culture. It's a really big deal in your life. It's a really big deal for Christians. And it's maybe even a bigger deal if you grew up in the faith and walked away from the faith because understanding how we got this is as, it's almost as important as what is in this because the backstory sheds light on the story. Now, part of the challenge really for all of us, for all of us, regardless of what kind of home you grew up in, Christian, non-Christian, um, part of the challenge is that the way that we got our Bibles, the way I got my first Bible, the way that you got your first Bible, if you got a Bible as a child, or you bought one as an adult, or you even just downloaded one on your phone, the, the difference, the, the challenge is that the way we got our personal Bibles is very different from the way we got the Bible. By the time I got my Bible, it was chaptered and versed and mapped and wrapped, right? It was all put together. The Jewish scriptures were in here. The Christian scriptures were in here. They were footnoted. I had these cool maps in the back and mine was wrapped as I told you last time and genuine, you know, fake artificial red leather with my name printed on it. And what color? <laughs> Gold, that's right, because that's what they did. I don't know why, but we all got our, our, uh, our names printed on our Bibles in gold. So we're talking about how we got the Bible. Now, the interesting thing is, um, if, you, if, I were to sur if we could survey everybody and I gave you a three by five card and those of you are watching from home or you're listening wherever you are, and I said, hey, would you write down on three by five card where you think the Bible came from? We would probably get as many answers as there are people listening and people watching. And there are all kinds of crazy, I mean, crazy ideas about where the Bible came from. And again, if you don't know the story of how the Bible came to be, it's just so much easier to dismiss everything inside of it. So just to kind of get us started, okay? Jesus did not write it. In fact, Jesus didn't write any of it. But here is the new information, really for most people, especially if you've walked away from faith or you grew up in faith but didn't know the story of the Bible. Jesus didn't write it, but Jesus is the reason that we have it. Our story begins, the story of the Bible begins not in Genesis, the story of the Bible begins when Jesus was discovered alive after he had been crucified. It's important to know, as we talked about last week, if Jesus had been crucified and didn't rise from the dead, you need to understand this would not exist. There would be nothing to write about. The reason men and women decided to document the life of Jesus is not what he taught, and it wasn't that he was crucified. Jesus made too many claims about himself. The fact that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea actually took a lifeless body down from a Roman cross proved that Jesus was not who he claimed to be and he was not who his followers hoped that he was. But when that tomb was discovered empty 
And when his disciples, and by disciples, I don't mean the 12 apostles, the hundreds of people that followed Jesus from the banks of the Jordan River throughout his ministry, when they saw him alive from the dead, these men and women who ran for their lives when he was arrested, went into the streets of Jerusalem and proclaimed not what they had read about, not what they'd heard about, but what they had seen with their own eyes, a resurrected savior, and the church began. And do you know where the church began? The church began in the city where Jesus was arrested and inside the city whose walls, outside those walls, Jesus had been crucified. It began right there with the, around the men and women who had said crucify him and around the men and women who had run for their lives when he was arrested. Right there in that city in that very same time frame, the church was launched. And so the events surrounding the life of Jesus, this resurrected rabbi, this resurrected um, son of man, son of life, resurrected, resurrection of the life, all these titles that he gave himself and others gave him, this, this very same Jesus, his, the, the events of his life were extremely important to first century followers. So many, and this is so unusual, this is an overlooked detail, many people attempted to write down an orderly account of the life of Jesus, not just a few, many. The fact, and again, I gotta move on, but the fact that we have four different documents that document the life of Jesus. In other words, we don't have references to these documents, and most of ancient history, you should know, are references to documents that we no longer have. In fact, you would be shocked how much ancient history, there are no copies of any original documents. It's authors who reference documents, who reference documents, and the documents are no longer with us because they just disintegrated over time. But the story of Jesus, who was a, come on, a nobody. In fact, if you don't believe Jesus is the son of God, then here's something we have in common. If he's not the son of God, he's a nobody. He's just another first century wannabe rabbi, wannabe Messiah who claimed things about himself that weren't true. He was a nobody. And yet we have four different accounts of the life of Jesus. And the reason we have those accounts is not what he taught and not that he was crucified and not that he was arrested. The reason someone sat down to document the life of Jesus is because he rose from the dead. So consequently, we talked about this last week. If you didn't hear the first part of this series, you really owe it to yourself to go back and watch. So consequently, we have the do this document we call Matthew that's an account of the life of Jesus, Mark, Luke, and John. And as soon as these were written, and they were written in different times, but as soon as they were written, they were, uh, they were immediately, immediately considered valuable they were immediately considered reliable and consequently sacred because of the story it told and inspired and very quickly, these four documents were considered by the early church to be scripture. But it's still it's important to understand, after the gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written, there was no Bible. There were just four accounts of the life of Jesus that the early church held in high regard. And as we just talked about last week, would eventually risk their lives to protect. And that's where the story picks up this week. Um, the apostle Paul and others left Judea and began telling Gentiles, non-Jewish people, about the claims of Jesus. And the biggest transition, the biggest struggle for Gentiles who were enamored by the life of Jesus and the message of Jesus, and Gentiles who wanted to embrace the life of Jesus, embrace Jesus as their savior and as their Lord, um, the struggle for them was the whole idea of giving up everything they had been brought up to believe, giving up everything that everyone around them had been brought up to believe, and embracing the idea that there was only one God. Now, this is such a, you know, a, a no-brainer for us because we're not polytheists, but in, it, it, would, it would be like many of you who grew up believing in God to suddenly just stop believing in God. It would be like those of you who don't believe in God to suddenly start believing in God. So the entire ancient non-Jewish world was expected in order to be a Christian to embrace this notion that there was only one God. This was unimaginable. It's important to know this, that in ancient times, people didn't convert from one religion to another. They didn't leave Islam to become Christian or leave Christian to become Buddhist or Buddhist to be Hindu. I mean, they, that's not how it worked. There weren't religions like that. Every region, every nation, the barbarians, the Romans, the earlier Greeks, you know, every region, every nation had their own gods. 
And most families had family gods, they worshiped their ancestors. And so when you move from place to place, you just took your gods with you, you just put them in a sack and brought them, set up your family altar, and nobody really cared what gods that you worship or, or served. In fact, you might adopt some more gods from the region you were in or something bad happened to you while you were worshiping some other gods, you may throw those in the fire and say, hey, those aren't really gods. So it didn't really matter. And as we said last week, the Roman Empire, they didn't care who you worshiped as long as you paid homage to Caesar and as long as you did not dishonor the Roman gods, you could keep your household gods, you could keep your family's gods, it just didn't matter. And then Christianity comes along and says, no, you have to give up all your gods. In fact, you should know this. In the first century and the second century, Christians were actually considered to be atheists. The Christians were the atheists. Why, in fact, that was the term that was used to describe them sometimes. Why were they considered atheists? Because Christians didn't believe in the gods. And then they added a new one who claimed to be the only one. So this was an obstacle for Gentiles to embrace Christianity, but more and more and more in different parts of the world, Gentiles came to faith in Jesus. But the idea of there being one God seemed to them to be very novel and very new. Now, this is a really important part of our journey. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about this next week, but this is the part maybe nobody told you. When Gentiles, when Gentiles became enamored with one particular Jew, who would that be? Yeah, not a trick question, everybody, who would that be? Yes, when the Gentile world became enamored with one particular Jew, they became enamored with the sacred text of the Jews. Now, before Jesus came along, this was not the case. I mean, there were always a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of Gentiles who followed Judaism as close as they can, could. Occasionally, somebody would actually be baptized and go through a ceremony to sort of become a Gentile version of a Jewish person. But for the most part, Gentiles were not interested in the Jewish sacred text for a lot of good reasons. Jews kept to themselves. Jews ate different kinds of food. Jews refused to work on the Sabbath. Jews would not allow you to marry their daughters and would not allow their sons to marry, would not allow their sons to marry your daughters and they would not allow their daughters to marry your sons. We know in the first century, the apostle Peter, one of Jesus' followers, 15 years after the resurrection, still had not entered a Gentile home and had probably never invited a Gentile into his home. So the Jews kept to themselves. They had their own dietary laws. So even, I mean, inside Judea and Galilee, where it's mostly Jewish, um, that was easy. But there were pockets of Jews in every major city, in Ephesus and Rome and Corinth and Galatia and the region of Galatia. And where they settled, they kept to themselves. So Gentile people had virtually no interest in Jewish religion and virtually no interest in the Jews until they were introduced to the gospel and the teachings of Jesus and the claims of Jesus. And they were confronted with the apostle Paul and Peter and others who were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And when they discovered that the Jewish text, which they called the law and the prophets, not the Old Testament, that wouldn't come till later. When they discovered that the law and the prophets were the backstory Story to this new story, they became interested in the Jewish text. They weren't interested in Judaism, and this causes a problem later on. They were interested in finding Jesus in the text of the Jewish people. Now, to their amazement, to their shock and awe, to, to a degree of, 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 of amazement we can't even begin to describe, when they um, began to explore the text of the, Jew, of the Jews. When they began to read it for themselves, they didn't even know what to call some of these. It, it took them till about the middle second century before the Gentile church even was able to assemble a list of Jewish texts that they would even eventually begin to consider a canon. So this, this t took place over a long period of time. But to their amazement, when they discovered that the Jews whose religion was older than the religion of the Romans, that was older than the religion of the Greeks, they discovered that the Jewish people had always, from the very beginning, only believed in one God, Yahweh. Now, a little bit of history for you before we get back into the plot line, because this is important. You know, during the um, first century and second century, third century, Christians were persecuted by the Romans because the Christians, as we said last week, would not worship the gods and would not declare that Caesar is Lord. But the Jews had never worshiped or honored the Greek and the Roman gods, and the Jews had never declared that Caesar was Lord. 
So a question you may have never asked before, but you should ask is why is it that the empire, the Roman empire gave the Jews a pass, but they persecuted the Christians? I mean, the Jews were just as guilty as the Christians of not declaring Caesar as Lord and not honoring any of the Roman gods, but the Romans left the Jews alone. And do you know why Rome allowed the Jews to have a pass as it related to Caesar and the Roman gods? And this is very important because Rome honored ancient things and the Romans knew that the Jewish religion was older than the story of Romulus and Remus that the Jewish religion was older than the pantheon of Greek gods. They recognized that the Jewish scripture and the Jewish religion was older than any of their religions. So even though they didn't honor Yahweh as God, they honored the fact that the Jewish religion was older than their religion, so the Jews got a pass. So when these Gentile Christians began for the first time, their scholars and their bishops began for the first time exploring Jewish scripture, they were shocked to discover that the oldest religion anyone ever knew about had recognized that there was only one God from the very beginning. The implications of this were staggering. The implications were that since ancient times, every single other nation that worshiped multiple gods that every family that worshiped their ancestors, that every single, single culture since ancient times had it wrong. And the Jews had known this from the beginning. They opened up, they unscrolled that first segment in the Jewish text that we call Genesis. And here's what they found. In the beginning, God. We've heard this so many times, we've read this so many times, you've argued this so many, against this so many times, you've disputed whether or not this is true or who wrote it, but don't, 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 don't miss the original context. And don't miss the implications of the original context. This was, this was shocking to the ancient world because what they would expect to find is what they found in all the other, Jew, in all the other non-Jewish cults and creation stories. In the beginning, the gods. God? The word Genesis is a Greek word. It actually means origin, the first book of our English Bibles. Moses wrote the first five books, we know for sure, of the, our English Bible and of the Jewish text. But something very interesting happened that has affected every single one of you here and every single one of you watching and listening. Here's what happened. In the 19th and 20th centuries, like currently, in the 19th and current, in the 19th and 20th centuries, archeological finds made the claims of what we find in Genesis a little suspect. In 19th and 20th centuries, archeological finds created doubt regarding the origins of the Jewish or the Genesis creation account. And here's why those doubt, where those doubts came from. In fact, most of us were taught this in a university or college setting or graduate school setting. They found Egyptian, Sumerian, um, Canaanite, and Babylonian creation texts. They, they discovered these texts and they were very similar. They were very similar, or so they thought, to the Hebrew text. Um, they were so similar that the initial assumption was this, that these ancient Hebrew texts actually borrowed from other ancient creation stories. In fact, when I was in college, I had a, a class on ancient um, civilization. And so we read some of you know portions of these ancient texts and sure enough, they sounded a lot like Genesis. And the assumption is, look, this wasn't, this didn't come from God. This doesn't, I mean, this, the, the ancient Hebrews just borrowed from all these other stories. So it's just, it's just one of many stories. Why take it seriously? The point being, it's not unique. What you need to know because who keeps up with this stuff other than nerds like me? What, what you need to know is that that view has been pretty much abandoned in scholarship. Not only, not only does Genesis not borrow from other creation myths, Genesis, Genesis stands in startling contrast to other ancient creation stories. Genesis is a worldview unto itself an extraordinary, ahead of its time worldview. In fact, the scientific community, the modern scientific community wouldn't even begin to catch up with the first statement in Genesis until 1927, when a Belgian priest first suggested the theory that we call the Big Bang Theory. 
that the universe had a beginning. Maybe you know this, now you will. Since the time of Aristotle, in the fourth century BC, since the time of Aristotle, everyone pretty much assumed that the universe just existed, that it had always existed, that matter just was. Albert Einstein embraced this idea that the universe just has always been. But in 1964, with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation that some of you studied in school, the view that the universe has always existed was abandoned. Scientists pretty much agree that in a trillion trillionth, in a trillion trillionth of a second, the universe expanded at an extraordinary speed from a, 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 the size of something smaller than a pebble to its current astronomical scope. Or, in the words of Genesis, in the beginning. Everything, everything that has a beginning has a cause. Not everything has a beginning and not everything has a cause, but everything that has a beginning has a cause. So the debate today, the debate in school, the things that you may be interested in, read about, the debate today is not did the universe have a beginning. The debate today is around was it a personal, purposeful, intentional cause. Now, we'll talk about that some other time. Back, back, back to Genesis. So, the significance, and this is what I want you to get, this is such a big deal, especially if you struggle with Genesis, and I'm gonna tell you about a resource in just a few minutes, so hang with me. The, the, the significance of what comes next is lost on us, and the reason the significance of what comes next in Genesis is lost on us is because the point that Moses is trying to make is actually assumed by us, or to say it a different way. Moses is building a case that's no longer needed because his argument ultimately succeeded. The point that Moses is trying to make is something that we all assume. But Moses is writing to an ancient, ancient, like triple ancient group of people who all they know is slavery, all they know is the power of the Egyptian gods, this pantheon of gods. And so Moses is trying to help them narrow their focus and re-believe and become atheists as it relates to the Egyptian gods and become believers in the one God, Mo Yahweh. So in Genesis, He's not trying to explain how God created the heavens and the earth. And this is where we get mixed up. Moses is making the point that God created the heavens and the earth, not the gods, just Yahweh. And so he says, in the beginning, God created, not Egypt's Amon Re or Babylon's Marduk, who rode into this epic battle. There's so much detail around Marduk, it's kind of cool. He rides into this epic battle on his two steeds, slaughterer and merciless. Marduk stands astride these two powerful stallions, and after defeating the goddess Tiamat by shooting an arrow into her mouth and through her throat, he splits her body in half. And with her, the upper half of her body, he creates the heavens. And with the lower part of her body, he creates the earth. I mean, you know, Sunday school for Babylonian children was like awesome, wasn't it? It's like, I don't wanna miss that, you know? <laughs> this epic battle of the gods, you know? But in Genesis, we find something extraordinarily, extraordinarily different. Not even close, no similarity, no borrowing. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis is nothing like the Egyptian creation myths. It is nothing like the Canaanite creation myths. It is nothing like the Babylonian creation myths, where the gods are at odds with themselves, where the gods war with each other, and then where the gods actually create other gods out of body parts and out of body fluids. And this brings us to the next epic ahead of its time statement. This is so extraordinary. The Babylonian creation myth, perhaps you've heard of and maybe studied and read parts of in college is called the Enuma Elish. It means when on high. Um, and in the Enuma Elish, mankind is eventually created. I think you're like five books into the Enuma Elish before you ever even get to the creation of mankind. And mankind is created to serve the lazy gods. So after becoming the chief of the gods, the king of all the gods, Marduk says the following, and this is actually a text um, from the Enuma Elish. Here's what Marduk says. He says, I will establish a savage. Man shall be his name. 
Savage man I will create. He shall be charged with the service of the gods that they might be at ease. In all of the ancient creation myths, mankind, womankind is an afterthought to take the load off, to lighten the load of the gods. Genesis is completely different. Because of the way ancient people embraced these ancient mythologies about their gods, the individuals had absolutely no rights. Women had absolutely no status, no hope. There was no intrinsic value in anyone. The violence and the injustice, the violence and the injustice of the gods justified the violence and the injustices of their leaders, the men and women that worshiped them. They were acting, the, the kings of these foreign nations and these pagan cults, the kings were essentially acting like their fathers in the heavens. And then you come to Genesis. In stark contrast with no parallel, nothing even close, a concept that the human race continues to struggle with even to this day, Genesis tells us the religion that was older than any of the current religions in the first century. Genesis says what no other pagan myth said. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. In the Jewish text, the creation of mankind, womankind is the pinnacle, not the afterthought of creation, which means, don't miss this, dignity, the dignity of every man, the dignity of every woman, the dignity of every child is established at the very beginning. This was unheard of. There was no parallel anywhere. And the pagan mythologies and the pantheon of gods that would develop after this through the ages, none of them established this kind of thought or this kind of idea, but it gets, there's more. What comes next is even more unthinkable, more unimaginable. This is why later archeologists and later um, scholars decided, you know what? The Jews didn't borrow from any of these ancient myths. This myth, as they would consider it, is, is far and away different. Again, it is a worldview unto itself because what came next was completely unimaginable. It would have been unimaginable 500 years later, 1,000 years later, 1,500 years later, almost 2,000 years later, this would still be unimaginable. Here's what, the, here's what the text says. And then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that, so that they may rule over, not worship, not make idols out of, not deify, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals. That in the very beginning, God told the, told the Jewish people, you will make no idols. You'll make no idol of me, Yahweh. You'll make no idol or images out of animals or other people or anything that crawls on the ground or flies in the air. You will have no other gods before me because there aren't any other gods. And I'm telling you, in stark contrast to the Egyptian um, pantheon of gods that they had just escaped from, God says, you will not worship nature. Think about this. You will not worship nature. You will rule over nature. The implication being, you will be the stewards of this world. An idea we are still wrestling to the ground this very day. Every single pagan culture following the establishment of the Jewish people worshiped nature and the elements of nature and the animals of nature and all kinds of mixtures of animals of nature. From the very beginning, God established a unique worldview. So God created mankind in his own image, unthinkable. In the image of God, it's repeated for emphasis. In the image of God, he created them. Ladies, male and female, he created them, look up here. You've heard me say this before if you've been around. I think every woman should be a Christian. Jesus was the first to elevate the status of women. This is why so many women follow Jesus. But ladies, in the very beginning, the God of the Jews, who became the God of the Christians, gave you dignity that the world is still trying to catch up with today. Only recently 
has civilization begun to wrestle the way it needs to wrestle with, the dignity of men and women. And it was there in the very beginning. Now, our problem with this, our problem is, is we get distracted because when we read Genesis, we think, oh, Moses is trying to explain how God created the world. I mean, how in the world, come on. How in the world can anyone understand in ancient times, especially how God created the world? His point wasn't how God created the world. His point was that God created the world. And we get all confused and focused on the timing and the sequencing of the creation account. And we miss, we miss the magnificence of these ancient statements. Moses, this is no exaggeration. Moses dropped a bomb in the very beginning. Moses introduced a radically, radically different, unparalleled, untested worldview. This would be the foundation of what would later be called the golden rule. And the golden rule is not reflected in nature. And let's be honest, the golden rule isn't even reflected in human nature. But the idea was introduced at the very beginning when God said, you are not a means to an end, you are not to worship nature. I'm going to make you as close as possible to me. I'm going to make you in my image, which means every man, every woman, every child you are ever face to face with bears the image of their creator. Be careful how you treat them. According to the Enuma Elish, according to the Enuma Elish, you were born a slave to the gods. According to the Numa Elish, you have no individual dignity, no individual rights. There is no redeemer and there is no afterlife. According to the new atheist, you were born a slave to your DNA. You have no free will. There is no redeemer and there is no afterlife. But in the very beginning, we are introduced to a God who saves, who redeems, and who delivers, and who never, ever, 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 ever gives up on you. All of this in the very beginning. A God who gives us, a free, gives us freedom to choose and then honors our choices. And then, and then Yahweh, does the most ungodly thing imaginable. He goes to work to reverse the consequences of mankind's decision to choose against him. Genesis 1 creates and gives us and provides us with the meta narrative of our lives, the big picture, the ultimate context for human experience, a monotheistic, worldview, a worldview, and please don't miss this, this is so important, a worldview that answers life's most important questions, the why questions, the why is there something rather than nothing question, more personal, why are you here and why do you matter? That you're here on purpose, with a purpose. You are not the result of some cosmic conflict between the gods and you were not created by the universe. God wanted image bearers who could know and relate to one another and image bearers that can know and relate to him. And this is my favorite part. And when the time was right, when everything was just as it needed to be, Yahweh, the God of Genesis joined us. But that's later, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so back to the first century Gentile. Sorry, I got kind of caught up. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, does that not just kind of make go, are you kidding? No, this is indisputable. This is, this is fabulous. This is why, well, we'll get to that too. Anyway, so back to the first century Gentiles before I, I lose my place. In the opening line of the Hebrew Bible, in the opening line of the Hebrew Bible, they realized something that it was very difficult, very difficult for first century Jews to acknowledge. In the opening line of the scripture that they began to adopt as their own scripture, they realized that the Jews had it right all along, which of course only fueled their interest in the law and the prophets, the Hebrew scriptures. 
And they moved very quickly to adopt the Hebrew scripture or the Hebrew Bible or the law and the prophets as their own Christian scripture. And thus the stage was set for the inclusion of Jewish scripture in the Christian Bible. But that inclusion would not be without its struggles. So please, please, please don't miss episode three of the Bible for grownups. Before you go, I wanna tell you about one more thing. Genesis is a complicated thing as it relates to science and as it relates to faith. So I wanna recommend a resource. One of my favorite authors, I think I've read five of his books now, and somebody just gave me an advanced reader copy of his newest book, I'm so excited. John Lennox is a, um, is a mathematician, an Oxford, um, he was an o Oxford professor for many, many, many years in math, and he wrote a book called Seven Days That Divide the World, a, The Beginning According to Genesis and Science. If the book of Genesis has been an obstacle to faith for you, if the book of Genesis is something that you're curious about and wonder how it line up, lines up with modern science, I highly recommend this resource. And here's why I take time to talk about it. I don't want any of you to spend another season of your life with leftover questions from college and graduate school or high school or a book you read or a blog you read or somebody told you something in a bar one night and it just kind of rocked your faith, you know? So as you decide and as you journey and as you navigate the complexities of real life and the ancient world and Jesus and all that you've been told, this may be a resource that will help you take a next step and I just wanted you to know about it. But next week, we're gonna pick up the journey in terms of how we got our Bible. <laughs>